Hello, and welcome to Union Tabernacle. We are so excited that you are joining us in our virtual environment today. If you haven't done so already, please like our Facebook page so that you will receive a notification when we go live. Also, share this worship service and tag your friends and family so that they can join you for worship. You can also follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love to connect with you here at UTAB. So in the comments section, go ahead and tell us where you're watching from and who's watching with you. Before service starts, we want you to know what type of church we are. Our mission is to impact the community and the world with cross-centered ministry. We do that by meeting the needs of others through outreach and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a purpose-driven church built on the five purposes of ministry, evangelism, discipleship, worship, and fellowship. We place great value in the next generation, and we are a church that loves to give. Welcome to UTAB. Anybody excited that this is the second Sunday of 2021? We're expecting brighter days. We're expecting brighter days. Oh, 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 oh yeah. When I close my eyes and think of you and reminisce about the things you do, I can't imagine my life without you. It's like paradise now that I know that it's real. It's a mystery. You're the one that gave your life for me. And what you did on Calvary makes me want to love you more. I never knew I could be so happy. And I never knew I'd be so secure Because of your love Life has brand new meaning It's gonna 
gonna be a brighter day, brighter day, brighter day. First to y'all, never thought that I would smile again. Never thought the dark clouds would end. Never thought that I would have a friend. Never keep me, never leave me alone. Jesus, you're my everything. You're the one that gave your life for me. Now I know it really means it's everlasting, lasting. I never knew I could be so happy. I never knew I'd be so secure. Because of your love, life has brand new meaning. Oh, it's gonna be a brighter day, brighter day, brighter day. Nothing can compare to the joy you bring and everlasting love affair. Jesus, my life will never be the same. Cause I found someone who truly For a brighter day, Lord. Won't you stand to your feet as we call the saints of God to worship and to celebrate? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth and good to all generations. How many people just glad again to give God praise on a Sunday morning? Glad to be in the service one more time. I said I'm glad to be in the service one more time. You know what? He didn't have to let me live. He didn't have to let me live. Oh, but I'm glad today that the Lord has again given me the privilege to lift up my hands, to lift up my voice, to open up my mouth and let him know how much I love him and appreciate him. Hallelujah! I said hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Well, listen, it's another day's journey, and I'm just glad again to be a part of it. Welcome to Union Tabernacle Baptist Church. Listen, if you are watching here on our Facebook Live for the very first time, we want you to go ahead and drop a note right there in the comment section. Let us know that you're here. Let us know that you're watching so that we can reach out and let you know how much we appreciate you stopping by to worship with us during this unusual time we understand that you have many choices that you could have just scrolled on past um, to use but you stopped here today to worship with us and we want to let you know that we're praying for you that God would minister to you 
during this one hour broadcast service. Let's pray together as we move further in our worship. Father, we love you and thank you for this another opportunity to give your name, praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for life, health, and strength, food, and shelter. We thank you for the vehicle of technology that allows us to worship together. Although in different places, we serve one God who can be everywhere at the same time. God, we thank you that although we are unable to draw near to one another, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. Meet some person who is watching this broadcast at their deepest point of need and minister to them as never before. If you do it, we'll be careful to give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody glad to be safe in his arms? God has kept us, and he's continuing to keep us. And we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I He lets me rest in the meadows grass, oh, and he leads me beside the quiet stream. He restores my failing end, and he helps me to do what I That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. Safe in His
for holding us close. Hallelujah. I'm safe in his arms. I'm safe in his arms. I'm safe. Safe in his arms. Truly, that is our encouragement for this day, to be safe in the arms of our God. He's strong enough to hold us all, and he cares about us when we need him. This morning I preach with a bit of a burden in my heart as this week the matriarch of our family my my grandmother made a transition and again it, it's just one of those days that I need the Lord to give us strength So I ask that you pray with and for me as I attempt to teach the word of God into our hearing. Let's pray first. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. From the place where the sun rises to the place where it goes down, your name is worthy to be praised. There is nobody like you. God, we love you and thank you for this another undeserved privilege to stand in your presence and preach a word to your people. Even as I open my mouth, God, I pray that you would speak through me as you have spoken to me. Allow that which you have deposited into my heart to flow from my heart to these thy people. Forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And then God, use me for your glory and our good as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just get to it. Galatians chapter number one. We begin our sermonic stroll through the book of Galatians this morning the, during the coming weeks uh, it's about 15 weeks we will walk through this wonderful letter which Paul wrote in hopes of drawing us nearer to God through a conviction of truth laid out in his word today I'm just going to preach the salutation Paul's greeting to the church at Galatia Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 and here is what the English standard version of the Bible reads Paul an apostle not from man nor through man but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord 
who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you take your seats, I want simply to label the message the significance of introductions. Again, I need your prayers this morning as I teach the word of God. The significance of introduction. Introductions matter. Most of us introduce ourselves differently in different settings. Me personally, depending on the setting that I'm in, I will introduce myself a few different ways. I may choose to introduce myself in relation to what I do. Hello, I'm Pastor Carter. Or who my parents are. I, I am the son of Carolyn and Mansai. If I'm in a casual or social setting with friends, I may introduce myself as Walt, how I introduced myself when I was on the college campus, or Walter, among my fraternity brothers. But then there are those times in familiar settings where I'm very comfortable, where I will even introduce myself using my lifelong nickname, Soup or Super. However, when I do that, I almost always have to give an explanation for my name. When people hear it, they will almost always ask, what's the story behind the name? Real quickly, I want to tell you that my Aunt Shirley, who is a member of this fellowship and probably watching this service is actually credited for being the first person to call me by that name. It was because my father, Walter Carter Jr.'s nickname was man size because of his large stature as a young man. And when she saw my beautiful fat baby body and cheeks, she looked at me and called me super size. My name now has been reduced down to just soup, but I often have to explain the whole story behind my name whenever someone hears me called. But the message behind who I am is due in large part to who my father was, man size, depending on what name you call me the very significance of our relationship and or where we met will become evident. Many of us have similar stories, don't we? How we are introduced tells persons who we are and it depends on what setting we're in. We do this in order to establish, here it is, connectivity and credibility. Listen, this is what the Apostle Paul here in his greeting is establishing. He gets right to the point by telling people who he was. We're trying to give that person a reference point, but, but we may also be trying to frame the conversation in order to establish why they need to listen to what we have to say. In Paul's letter to the Galatian church, he introduces uh, a framed focus in this letter. It is also to establish, watch it now, the tone and tenor in the letter. In order to appreciate the tone and tenor in the introduction that Paul gives in the letter to Galatians, you must first look at how he typically introduces the letters in various places. Let me walk you through it real quick. First, the Corinthian church and his introduction. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, 
Paul says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus, of Jesus Christ, and our brothers, Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ both their Lord and ours. Here it is, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that is given to you in Christ Jesus. Listen to how he talks to his beloved church at, Phil at Philippi. In Philippians chapter number one, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Here it is, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, listen, I thank my God in my remembrance of you. I always in every prayer of mine for you making prayer with joy. This is what he says to the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Once again, lastly, uh, the church at Thessalonica, to the church at Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Now listen again to how he addresses the church at Galatia and see if you can't yourself pick up on the tone and tenor that you can anticipate in this letter. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches at Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you notice really carefully the the thing that is standing out about Galatians from the other books that Paul wrote, other letters that Paul wrote, is there is no thanksgiving and prayer. Paul, in this letter, has a very solemn and, and fatherly tone in his voice as he writes a letter of uh, exhortation or, or rebuke or reproof to the church at Galatia because they had allowed themselves to be infiltrated by a group of false teachers called the Judaizers who were teaching a false gospel that significantly implied that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was necessary for salvation, but we needed to do some more stuff. That they needed to go through the uh, legalistic ritual of the Mosaic law by being circumcised and following the law and giving their honor and their dedication to keeping it. But Paul is clear that this is a gospel of grace. We have been saved by grace alone, in, in faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no other mix that needs to be added to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My God from on high, what a magnificent letter this is going to be. We're going to walk through this letter and we will begin together to better understand the truth 
and power of the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You need to pay close attention, grab your pen and paper, and walk with us through the truth of this wonderful letter that Paul writes to the churches at Galatia. It was not a singular church, but rather it was a group of churches in the region of Galatia. This letter has been called the Declaration of Independence of the Christian Liberty. It reads much like the book of Romans, but it's much less complex. For the sake of time, I, want to, I wanted to make sure to pause and walk through this greeting very carefully so that you can gain an appreciation for Paul and his pastoral or apostolic authority among this church. Here is what I stood to tell you. Speaking for God requires clarity about who you are and whose you are. Let me say it again just in case you want to write it down. Speaking for God requires clarity of who you are and whose you are. The text breaks down just in two sections. First, we'll talk about the apostolic authority that Paul established. The emphasis on Paul's apostolic credentials is significant here. Paul has strong words for the Galatians, and they must understand that he writes with authority. Not just any authority, but with apostolic authority. Every one of us must answer this question, what will I respect as an authority in my life? Paul expected that Christians would respect his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. One of the difficulties of leading a church that is filled with family members is that sometimes I have to do what Paul does here is to remind those who have become familiar with me about the authority, not that I have been given from them, but rather the authority that I've been given from God. The word apostle, as Paul uses it here, does not merely refer to who has a message to announce, but to an appointed representative with an official status who is provided with the credentials of his office. Paul says, I come with a message for you from God through Jesus. Paul identified himself as an apostle but immediately turned his focus towards the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to make sure that this is not about me, but rather about the one who sent me. He pointed out that he secured the title of apostle, not from a vote, a church council, or some board of elders, but rather from Jesus who was raised from the dead. He did not earn that title like someone would go to school and study and write a dissertation and earn a, de a degree of sorts. No, Paul is a grace case and he's clear about the fact that he has this assignment because God gave it to him. He did not earn it. He did not deserve it. But God gave it to him. God gave Paul the title and responsibility of being an apostle. At the very onset of this letter, Paul emphasizes God's grace over human effort. See, in order to appreciate God's grace over human effort, you got to really go back and read Acts chapter 9 where Paul, who was known then as Saul, was a persecutor of Christians. He was someone who went about putting Christians in jail out even put to death. Paul was present when the first deacon, Stephen, was stoned as he held the coats of the first 
Christian deacon and had him put to death. Paul was standing right there. He did not deserve to carry the message of Jesus Christ, but God had given him a significant appointment and assignment, which was grace. That is God giving us what we don't deserve. Paul doesn't deserve it. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. If you're here and you can hear my voice, I want to tell you that you are a grace case, whether you like it or not. Paul called for grace and peace to be bestowed on his readers, which he did in other letters as well. Here, however, he gave a much more deep explanation. He emphasized salvation as a free gift, noting that Jesus gave himself for our sins to secure our salvation. You see, Paul goes on significantly with this somber and pastoral tone in his voice to say, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul's calling as an apostle was not from man, nor was it through man. It didn't originate with man, and it didn't come by way of man. It originated with God and came directly to Paul from God himself. He, his standing as an apostle was not based on opinion polls or human counsel or some vote or election. No, Paul was an apostle sent to God's people by God himself with a message of grace as a free gift. It is based on his divine call made through both the God the Father and God the Son. But then not only do we need to establish Paul's authority because he writes to them from God by grace, but he also has an aim for the letter, which is seen in the second half. This is Paul's familiar greeting. We've already addressed the differences between other epistles that Paul wrote and this one, but we're drawing on the traditional greetings. Um, grace is Greek and Peace is Jewish in those cultures. Paul uses these exact phrases three, uses the exact phrase of verse three and five times in the New Testament. Grace, watch it now, is always first. Peace is always second. This is due to the fact that grace Hey, help me now, uh, is the source of peace. Listen, you can't have peace with God unless he first gives grace. God giving us what we don't deserve in the blood of Jesus Christ who gave himself to be crucified for our sins. God does exactly what we need, although we don't deserve it. And because God gives us grace, you and I can experience his peace. Paul uses the word grace a lot of times, a hundred times in his writing. In fact, among all the other writers in the New Testament, it is only used 55 times. Paul was an apostle of grace. Now, I don't know what makes you shout, but, but when I think about grace and what I, when I think about what I deserve, what I, what I should have gotten, what, where I should be living, where I should be working, I should be dead, sleeping in my grave on my way to a burning hell, but God gave me grace. He gave me an assignment. He gave me his power. He gave me a church. He gave me your soul so I could watch for it. And I want to tell you, I'm a grace case, just like Paul. And when you know who you are and whose you are, you can speak with clarity and power to God's people. This is what Paul is establishing in his salutation. Listen, he goes on to say, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin. Paul wished grace and peace on the readers from the Galatian churches and to you and I, I believe. Now, Paul will briefly expand on the work of God that brought us grace, our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing he says about Jesus Christ, watch it, is that he gave 
himself for our sins. I want you to understand this. They didn't take Jesus' life, but he, he gave it for our sins. Jesus gave. We know John 3.16, don't we? That God the Father so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, but the Father didn't do the only, wasn't the only one that did some giving. Jesus gave his life for our sins. Jesus is a loving, giving God and loving, giving Savior. He laid down his life for you and I. Listen, the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for a friend. Now I know it's not resurrection season but there is a song that we sing around Easter time that says he would not come down from the cross just to save himself. He decided to die just to save me. And I want you to know that Jesus died not at the, at the will of men but at the will of God. He gave his life so that you and I can be saved. And because he gave his life, you and I, through grace, can have peace. That is peace with God. Sin has caused a great chasm to be between you and God. God hates sin. I want you to know that Jesus came to pay our sin debt for us. He gave. He gave. He offered himself to be a ransom. He became our substitutionary sacrifice so that you and I could receive his righteousness. He took upon himself our sinfulness and he gave his life. He gave himself for our sins. Listen, for our sins. This is why Jesus had to give himself because our sins had to be put on him. Our sins put us on the road to ruin and destruction. We were on our way to hell, but Jesus died to save us. If God did not do something to save us, our sins would have killed us. You, your sins would have drugged you in to a pit that will be bottomless and unable to, 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 to rescue you from death, hell, and the grave. Jesus gave himself for our sins. The love was always there. But there would never have been the need for Jesus to give himself if our sins had not placed us in a terrible place. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way through Revelation 22, you need to understand that we were on our way to hell, but because of the price that Jesus paid, that we have the right to the tree of life. You and I can be saved from our sin. The word for in this passage is significant. It, it clearly has the idea of substitution. He took our place. That we might be, here it is, delivered from the present evil age. In many ways, the Galatians were in a battle with and sometimes losing against the evil age. They needed to know that Jesus had already come to save them from the evil age. In the context, Paul is referring to the false teachers who had seemingly found their way into the churches at Galatia and were causing them to look back to legalism, the law, and the rituals. They were telling them that not only do you need to believe in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, but you also need to be circumcised. You also need to obey and commit to the Mosaic law. And Paul says that that ain't the case. There is no other gospel that can save you that Jesus has delivered us from that evil age. The idea behind the word deliver is not deliverance from the presence of something, but deliverance from the power of something. We, we will not be delivered from the presence 
of the evil age because we are living in some evil times. You are not delivered from being around or affected by the foolishness of our current culture and climate. We are in the middle of a pandemic of a, a worldwide proportion where over two and a half million people have died as a result of this horrible virus that is spreading throughout the world. We are at our homes watching our worship services uh, on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. We are unable to draw near to each other because we are living in the present evil age. But I like what Paul is saying here, that he died to deliver us. Now, that doesn't mean that we will be delivered from being in the present evil age, but we will, we will be delivered from the power of the present evil age. Oh, somebody ought to just shout, I got the power to, to overcome the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To whom glory, who, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Now, I ain't got time, but, but I just need to tell you that none of this could have happened had it not been providentially placed into time from God the Father. You see, it was God's will that even had Paul, who was formerly Saul, a persecutor of Christians, to be converted and now becomes the gospel globe trotter to the Gentiles just so that you and I could be saved. Paul says, I'm on an assignment by the will of Almighty God. He says, listen, my authority is clear. God called me. My aim is clear so that I can preach the gospel of grace to you and you need to make sure that you hear me clearly. This is what Paul is trying to establish in these first five verses. He wants to make sure that they know who he was and whose he was, they, who, whose he was so that he could speak with clarity and power to the people of God. You see, false teachers have a terrible effect among the people of God. All it takes is one slip word and you will fall into a pit of legalistic living trying to struggle and strive and earn your way to heaven. Listen, baby, you couldn't earn heaven if you work all day and all night. You can't work hard enough to deserve to be in God's presence. But Jesus, hey, Jesus did all that was necessary and all we have to do is confess our sins before him in the name of Jesus and receive him into our hearts so that we could be saved. False doctrine was a real problem in the Galatian churches. And their false doctrines robbed God, hear me, of his glory. You see, when we suggest that human effort is necessary for salvation. Now, that's not to suggest that you should not try to live a life pleasing to God because you should. But I don't care how hard you try, you can't earn salvation. You can't work your way into heaven. You got to be saved by the grace of God. Paul wrote to this Galatian church to address this false teaching. That more than Jesus was needed in order to be saved. Some people in Galatians had even abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ, accepting the idea of circumcision and other Jewish rites of keeping the law, which were also required for salvation according to them. As such, Jesus' death was necessary, but it wasn't enough to secure salvation. What did you just say? Listen, they were teaching in the churches of Galatia that Jesus' death wasn't enough. And because they were robbing Jesus of, the, of, of all of the, the, the due credit 
for salvation. They were robbing God of his glory. And I want to tell you that I don't care what you've done, how good you live, how many degrees you have, how much money you got in the bank, what kind of clothes you wear. Listen, you can't earn your way into salvation. God gave it to us through Jesus Christ. He and he alone is the source of of salvation. You ought to go on and give God praise from your home because Jesus has done more than enough to secure our redemption. He has bought our sins with his precious blood and it was all because, here it is, the motivation behind it, so that God could be glorified. God's glory is magnified by the fact that he doesn't need you to save you. God saved you without you. And all I got to say as I go to my seat uh, this morning is, is, is that great song that, that, that has been sung down through the decades. How can I say thanks for the thing that you've done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Just let me live. I want to live my life so that it would be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with his blood. He has saved me, and with his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Listen, this is a significant uh, introduction because when we understand who we are and whose we are, we can speak with power and clarity to God's people. To God be the glory. We would like to, at this time, give you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior. We just want you to know that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Bible lets us know that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we would simply just confess them to Him. Why would God do this? Because He loves you so much. How much does He love you? He loves you so much that He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross for your sins. Yes, that's right. That's what John 3.16 tells us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And yes, you too can have everlasting life today. And that's what we offer you. We offer you an opportunity to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior, to accept the measure in your heart. And how do you do this? You simply do it by this. You accept you, you admit that you are a sinner. Believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin, and one day ultimately saved from the presence of sin. List in the comments below. Let us know that you've made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior or you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And someone from our hospitality ministry will get in contact with you to share with you and to welcome you into our family. Thank you so much. Time to refocus. Please join us January 4th to January 24th for our 21 day fast. The daily time for consecration will be 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Throughout the week, we will have a daily devotional call at 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. on Saturday. Also, each member is asked to give $100 for our first fruit offering. Please join us as we give sacrifices to God leading up to our 2021 Vision Conference. Please join us for our 2021 Vision Conference, Monday, January 25th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Ministry leaders will also receive an individual email invite for Pastor Carter to schedule a meeting. Please pray for our pastor as he prepares to cast vision for 2021. 
Our weekly small group opportunity starts on Sunday with Sunday School. Sunday School will begin promptly at 9.15 via Zoom. The winter theme is called the New Testament and will run through February. Also, every Tuesday we have Student Bible Study, which starts at 6 p.m. Please refer to GroupMe for any meeting links. This has been your Impact News. God bless. Hey, what's up, UTAB? Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Listen, here at Union Tabernacle, we are endeavoring to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order to do that, we ask that our members partner with us to end giving. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Listen, if you want a running over blessing, you ought to be willing and joyful in your giving. Listen, we've given you three different options for your giving. You can give through Givelify, which is an application you can download, and in three easy taps on a secure server, you can give to our church as often as you like. Or you can go to our church website and click on the Give tab there and do so through PayPal. If you'd like to mail your gift here to Union Tabernacle, you can do so at 6623 South Stewart Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60621. Listen, just do me a favor. Smile when you give. Because God loves cheerful giver. It's giving.